Would you like to know even more about semantics for intuitionistic logic? Yes, you would. So let's take a look. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Attic. I'm Mark Jago. This is part two of our video on semantics for intuitionistic logic. Here's the previous video, part one. In there, we introduced kind of the basics of how we go about setting up a semantics for intuitionistic logic. We talked about going through an, an investigation in stages and how we can kind of capture that formally using Kripke models, relational models, kind of like we would do if we were doing modal logic. In this video, we're going to take that a bit further and see the precise definition of a model. We're going to go through each of the semantic clauses for each of the connectives and see how they work. And then later on in the video, I'm going to show you how you can translate from intuitionistic logic into classical modal logic. And that can be a pretty good way that I found, you know, lots of students find if they're having trouble with understanding the intuitionistic connectives, we can translate it into classical mode logic, which maybe we're a bit more comfortable with. And it gives us a good sense of what these symbols, particularly the negation and the arrow in intuitionistic logic, what they mean. OK, so let's take a look. OK, so now let's look at an exact definition of these models. We're going to see some similarities with stuff that we've done already. Models are triples. We've got a set of states, the stages of our investigation. We've got an accessibility relation. These are arrows between the states and we've got a valuation. Now, these arrows between states, they can't go any which way like they could in modal logic. Here, we're always going forward in this investigation. So the accessible states are going to be the one you're currently in, plus all the ones you could get to in the future. In other words, we want this accessibility relation to be reflexive and transitive. We don't always draw the arrows on when we're drawing these diagrams because like by convention, we know that those arrows are going up the page. So we draw our diagrams from bottom to top from a starting state going up the page, and then we basically don't need to draw the arrows on. It always goes upwards. We're going to do the valuation function a little bit differently as well. In classical logic, it would be dishing out truth values. It'd say that sentence true, that sentence is false. That's not quite what we're doing here. We want to say that at a certain state, some sentences are going to be verified. So what we're going to do is our valuation is going to say at this state, these are the sentences that are verified. VS is going to be a set of primitive sentence letters, P, Q, R, and they are going to be all and only the sentences verified at that state. So that's a set of sentences and they are going to be the ones that are verified at state S. So if P is in that set, then it's verified at state S. And if P isn't in that set, then it's not verified at that state. One more thing we need to add there. Remember this idea that as we go on in the investigation, we don't forget stuff that we've learnt. So as we go further up the page, we shouldn't lose the things that we've already verified. If S verifies P and I can get from S to U, then U should verify P as well. So this is what the hereditary condition says. It says, if there's an arrow from S to U, then anything verified in state S should also be verified in state U. OK, hereditary condition says you don't forget stuff. Stuff doesn't get lost as you go further up the page. If it's verified lower down and you can get further on, it's going to be verified at that later state as well. OK, so we're going to build up this general idea of a state verifying a sentence. So we're going to read this as state S verifies sentence A. How does that definition go? Well, a state verifies P or Q or R just in case it's one of the sentences that the valuation dealt out to that state. We're never going to verify the Folsom constant. S verifies not A just in case Every state you can get to from S, that's including the current state because we've got reflexivity, doesn't verify A. Two easy clauses now. To verify A and B, it's just a case of verifying A on its own and verifying B on its own. Verifying A or B, that's just a case of verifying A on its own or verifying B on its own. 
And now the other tricky clause, for S to verify a conditional, if A then B, that means we look at all the accessible states, that's including the current one, again, because of reflexivity, and we say, if that state verifies A, then it had better verify B as well. Okay, so for all future states, if A's there, B's there. That's what it takes for the current state to verify if A then B. Validity is like in the case of modal logic. A sentence is valid when it's verified by every state in every model. An entailment, again, that's like modal logic. For the premises to entail the conclusion just means at every state in every model, if all the premises are verified, then the conclusion is verified as well. So you might have noticed that these models that we're talking about for intuitionistic logic, they look a lot like the models for modal logic. And that got even clearer as we started building up the formal details of these models. We've got these states, we've got the accessibility relation, it's reflexive and transitive. So it's looking an awful lot like a modal logic. And in fact, there's a way in which you can translate from intuitionistic logic to classical modal logic. It goes like this. So starting with your intuitionistic language, if you've got a primitive sentence letter P, just stick a box in front of it, box P. If you've got a negation, not A, again, you just stick a box in front of it, box not A. If you've got a conjunction or a disjunction, you leave them alone, you just translate them as they are. And if you've got a conditional, if A then B, you stick a box in front of it, box if A then B. And then you read these ones, the translations, in the classical way. OK, so you read the negation here as the one that toggles between truth and falsity. And you read the arrow here as basically meaning either not A or B. But it's a classical modal language. And in particular, we want KT4 to be our modal logic there. That's because in the intuitionistic models, we've got reflexivity and we've got transitivity. So once we've got our models for intuitionistic logic in the way that we've been doing them here, it's kind of no surprise that you can do this translation because we've basically just spelled out models for KT4. We've got an accessibility relation that's reflexive and transitive. So it's kind of no surprise that these are secretly modal operators. But actually, historically, the translation came first. OK, so people realized that you could translate intuitionistic logic into modal logic. You get the same theorems coming out once your modal logic is KT4. And then once you had a semantics for one of them, your semantics for intuitionistic logic comes along as well. And that's basically how the history of this stuff went. For a long time, there was modal logic and intuitionistic logic, which exist in a kind of proof theoretic framework but there was no semantics for either logic. And then as soon as people worked out the semantics for one of them, kind of bang, you had semantics for both of them together. OK, guys, so there you have the Kripke semantics for intuitionistic logic. It does get kind of complicated, so you might have some questions. If you do, leave me a comment down below. Thank you very much for all your support. I will see you guys next time.